want to show you what God blesses. Bow before him. I'll take it even further. This is the kind of leadership that God blesses in our lives. If you have your Bible, turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 6. The book of Acts, chapter 6. And uh, we're just walking through the book of Acts together as a church family. You can follow along with the digital message notes just by scanning the QR code today. Um, Today I'm concluding this mini-series that I've been sharing over the last three messages about how to live a remarkable life. Remarkable just simply means exceptional, outstanding, uncommon, or worthy of attention. And I, and I made this statement the first week that these three characteristics that we're looking at really help deliver us from the three great traps of life. You know, there are some great traps that all of us can fall into along the way. And I didn't really describe what those things are. We see what those traps are. I just want to share these with you. These characteristics are so powerful. First John chapter 2 shares that there are three traps of life. The first trap is the lust of the eyes. In other words, wanting everything. And so we looked at the first week, the antidote, generosity, remarkable generosity. The second trap is the lust of the flesh. This is doing what feels good to you, that just whatever your flesh wants. And the antidote to that, we looked at it uh, two weeks ago, and that was integrity, living a life of integrity. In other words, to please God, not to please ourselves. And so today we're going to talk about how to escape the last trap, and that's the pride of life or just being focused on ourselves and our accomplishments and all the things we do and who we are and look at me. And the antidote we're going to look at today is humility. That's what I want to talk about today. Remarkable humility. Can you say that with me? Remarkable humility. You guys sound great today. First Peter chapter 5 and verse 5 says this, clothe yourselves with humility. In other words, this is not a natural characteristic. We're going to have to make An intentional decision, just like you made an intentional decision to put on your clothes today. Thank the Lord. (laughs) What I'm going to talk about today has to be an intentional decision to put on because it doesn't come natural. Why do we do that? Verse 5 says, because God opposes the proud. So it's repellent. Pride is a repellent to God. But he shows favor to the humble. So humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand watch this here's a great promise that he may lift you up when what does it say we want him to lift us up immediately from time to time but the promise is in due time when it's when it's when when the time is right if we live a life of humility God will bring so many good things if we will just trust in him. This message is completely countercultural today. We live in a culture that's me focused, me centric. There's a, a new invention or a new phenomenon of the last, I don't know, 10 years, and that's the selfie. Around 92 million selfies are snapped every day. Now, if you live with teenagers, you may think, Brandon, that's a little low. It should be higher than that, I know. Google said last year, uh, last year alone, 24 billion selfies were uploaded to the internet. We are constantly taking pictures of ourselves. And, and hey, I, whenever I started putting this message together, I thought, you know what, I'm not the selfie guy. I mean, I don't take a lot of selfies. I thought, you know, I was really feeling good about myself. And then I looked on my phone, and there's actually a category on my phone that automatically says how many selfies I have. And according to my phone, I've taken 1,795 selfies. I busted myself. (laughs) I saw a a statistic as well, fascinating, that there are a tragic number of people who have actually died taking selfies. Places like the Grand Canyon, places trying to get an extreme selfie, putting themselves in danger to get the perfect photo of themselves. Uh, The study found that 379 people were killed taking selfies between 2008 and 2021, with even more injured. It's a dangerous game, taking selfies, everybody. 
according to the statistics, death by selfie is more likely than death by shark. So be careful out there in these streets, everybody. It's funny. It's what's sad. Not funny for those who. But um, it, the truth is, I know that's extreme, but the truth is there truly is danger when we point the focus on ourselves instead of pointing the focus on the Lord and on others. And that's what Acts chapter 6 is all about. Acts chapter 6, there's a problem in the church. We, we've walked through a lot of what has happened so far in the life of the early church. And I think, um, if you're like me, I just assume that whenever God's moving and the Holy Spirit's moving, there's not problems. Well, we've looked over these past few weeks that there were some problems. There were some issues that came in our lives. And all of us are going to experience problems along the way. Someone shared this with me recently. What is a problem? P, it is a predictor. It has the ability to predict what we will become by our response to it. R, it's a reminder. Problems are reminders that all of us need God. Because we will always have problems. You say, be positive, Brandon. I'm positive we will always have problems. <laughs> we say we want to see miracles, but every miracle starts with a problem. What's a problem? It's, oh, an opportunity. Every problem is an opportunity to watch God work. An opportunity to become better, to change. A problem is be a blessing. Almost every blessing, think about it, we've experienced in our lives was given to us on the other side of great problems. What is a problem? L, it's a lesson. Problems are a lesson. We learn as we walk through problems. E, problems are everywhere. There's problems everywhere, every day, all around us. And lastly, M, problems are a message. Through every problem, God is speaking to us. I say to you today, if you're walking through a problem, don't be discouraged. Even the early church walked through great problems. But if we will respond with humility in the middle of our problems, God could work mightily and actually do things we could never, ever imagine in our lives. So let's look at it together. Acts chapter 6 and verse 1. We're just going to walk through uh, the first few verses of Acts chapter 6. This is an exciting part in the book of Acts. It says this, in those days, so what was their problem? In those days, number Acts 6, 1, when the number of disciples was increasing. So we get a little bit of picture of the problem. The problem was growth. We don't know exactly what the time frame of this was. Theologians say this could be as long as five years from Acts 5 or actually just as close as one year to Acts 5. And the early church, this is fascinating. The church at Jerusalem was running at this time 30 to 40,000 people. Wow. There were so many things happening. There were logistical issues, management problems, collection issues, distribution of resources issues. How do you baptize 40,000 people, everybody? That's a good problem. I'd like to have that problem. Praise the Lord. You know, there's issues and problems, meetings, communication. How are they going to handle all this? And the disciples, the apostles, were at a pivotal moment because here's what they realized. I can't do it all. I can't be the one that figures out every problem. I can't be the one that fixes everything, everything in my life. And up to this point, God was moving mightily in Jerusalem and in Judea. But that wasn't what Jesus just called them to do. They were called to reach the world. And so this was so pivotal because they could have just said, we've arrived. Look at it. You know, 40,000 people. Praise God. Like, look at what the Lord's done. You know what? We're just going to sit back and do nothing. But they chose to change because they had a mission to make a difference in the world. I can identify with this so much. I've been here at every stage of this church for the last nine years since our family of four moved here in 2015. And I've seen it go from the four of us. Now we have a family of five, but at the time Baylor wasn't born. I've seen it go from four to over 5,000 this past Easter. It's been a difficult journey because each season has required something that's not fun at all, everybody. Change. Could you say that with me? Change. Oh, my goodness. I get anxious just hearing the word. Change. I was with a group of pastors from... Uh, at a, uh, a retreat this past week, and they were talking, asked me a question about City Hills. What's been the hardest thing about 
you know, leading the church, I said, well, that's easy. Me changing, <laughs> leading myself and changing and growing in every season. Because here's what I've learned about leadership. What makes you, what made you effective in the last season will make you ineffective in this season if you don't change. You got to be willing to trust the Lord enough to say, God, what are you doing right now? What are you calling me to do? Or else you'll get this mentality of us four and no more. And you'll live your life circling the wagons and living in fear. And I want to say, just like this early church, City Hills, we've not arrived. We have not arrived. God still has great things in store. We've seen God do great things. People even say, well, City Hills is a large church. And, and yeah, it's the largest church I've ever been a part of. But I always say, large from whose perspective? Mine or God's? From my perspective, yeah, there's a lot of people here. But from God's perspective, there's over 800,000 people here in our region that need the hope and life of Jesus Christ. And I pray every church in our city and region grows and experiences miraculous revival that we see God move, not just in our church, but all around our city and move in God's presence and power. I want to tell you about something I'm excited about. Tomorrow, we're having a pastor's prayer lunch that's being hosted here at City Hills. Thank you for your generosity. We're joining pastors together because we're going to see a revival in our city because the best is yet to come. Come on, somebody. <laughs> so growth brings new challenges. The disciples were increasing. Some people are like, I don't want to change. And, but I, I got a question. Do you want to experience all that God has for you? I know change is hard, but God is so good. If we'll just trust him, and allow him to change our lives. So what was the problem? So the church was growing, and there was a specific problem. It goes on, Acts 6.1. The Hellenistic Jews, these are Greek Jews. So you had the majority of Christians in the early church were, part, were from Jerusalem. They would be Hebraic Jews or people from Israel. And then you had outside People that were still Jewish people, but they just lived in the Greek world. They lived, they were not from Jerusalem. Undoubtedly, they came there, experienced the move of the Holy Spirit, and they're like, hey, we're staying here. We're gonna, we're gonna hang out here and we're not gonna go home. So you have these two groups of people. The Hellenistic Jews, they were complaining against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the issue was that the Greek Jews, those that weren't from Jerusalem and Judea, felt like their widows were not being cared for. I think in this passage, we get to see differences in the church. God forbid if the church is just all the same people from the same place that think the same way. We get to see a picture in the early church. You had a diversity. You had difference. You had difference of opinion, different um, linguistic differences. They would, the Greeks would have spoken different languages. There were cultural differences. Definitely philosophical differences and how problems could be solved. And in the middle of the differences, the enemy's working to try to cause discord. Mark, mark this down. This is the truth. Whenever the church is growing, you can be sure the enemy is in the middle of it, doing, trying to do one thing and one thing only, trying to cause division, dissension, and disunity in the body of Christ. Because Satan knows that he is no match against a unified church. But if we'll divide over our differences, we'll actually destroy ourselves and he doesn't even have to mess with us. Satan is terrified of unity. Unity in a family, unity in your marriage, unity in a church family, unity in a friend group to make a difference for the kingdom of God. Anything unified will have to actively fight the devil to stay that way. If your marriage wants to be unified, just, just, just mark it down. You're going to have to fight the devil. If you're going to, have to be unified as a church, we're going to have to fight the enemy we have to focus on our priorities, not just our preferences. We all have preferences. Nothing wrong with our preferences. We have political preferences. Oh, it's an election year, everybody. Welcome to 2024. We had one of these four years ago. It was a wonderful, difficult year, was it not? What, what is highlighted? Our differences. But the church is a place where instead of the world dividing us by our differences, the church is a place where we come together even though we are different. And instead of lifting up the name of a candidate or a political party, amen, we lift up the name that's above every name, the name of Jesus. That name is going to be heralded for all eternity. And that's what we're doing. We're putting our priority 
so that the world would know about who Jesus is. And there's all kinds of differences. There's political, there's theological differences around non-essential issues. There's all kinds of differences that we as a church will have to make a decision. But I just say, let the church be different. In the church, we are one. We come from a variety of different backgrounds. The color of our skin may be different. We may all not all see things exactly the same, but we love one another and we care for one another. We are brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. And I pray the church looks like heaven on earth. A divided world needs a united church, everybody. So, so the issue was... The widows were not being cared for. I, I, I love this because we're supposed to be a church just like this church that cares for people outside of our wall. Cares, cares for people outside of our walls, but cares for people in need inside of our walls. These widows. The Hebraic widows were being cared for. The Greek widows were not. Complaining was happening and it was affecting the church. I just want to stop right here and to say if you are a widow or a widower, part of our church family. We love you. We care for you. We support you. We are here for you. And I, I, I'm not trying to just single anyone out, but we want to pray for you today. I just love the heart of this passage to say, you know what, we're going to care for widows. And I would add to widowers, people who have experienced that. If you are a widow or a widower here today, could you stand? And I just want to pray a blessing over you. Maybe it's just for somebody online. If you'd be bold enough to stand here today. And, and I just want to pray. We're going to pray over every widow and widower in Jesus name. Lord, I just pray your blessing over every widow that's part of our church. Every, every widower, God, that let them know today that they are seen. God, that they are cared for, that they are loved, that we as a church want to stand with them and love them and care for them and support them and to let them know they are not alone in what they are walking through. Holy Spirit, would you just come in a special way today and bless every widow and every widower. Let them know today marks a moment of just you loving them in a special way. In Jesus name, amen, amen, amen. That's what we're supposed to be. Thank you for standing. If you are in need and you're a widow or a widower, please let us know as a church. We want to help you. We want to serve you. We want to care for you. I, I, I love the response here in Acts 6 from the apostles. I love the response. They could have responded a lot of different ways. They could have said, you know what? We're the apostles. Forget about it. They could have said, you know what? Not a big deal. What's going on with people in need? You know what? Look at how many people are around here. We're kind of awesome. They could have said, you know, I don't want to hear about any problems. They could have said a lot of things. But watch what they said. Verse 2. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit of wisdom. And we will turn this responsibility over to them. And will give our attention to prayer and to the ministry of the word. This was such a powerful moment of humility in the church that I think is reverberating today. It's reverberating today. And it really makes what the local church is called to be. It really sets us apart as, a, as the way that we are called to lead in such an awesome way and follows the example of Jesus Christ. This was a pivotal moment. And I want to show you through this three habits of humble people, three habits of humble leaders. I don't know where the sphere of influence that God's called you to lead, but here's just a challenge. Three things of how to have incredible, remarkable humility in our lives that I see here through, this response, through the response of the apostles. Here's the first one. Number one, the humble get over themselves. I didn't say this is going to be an easy message, everybody. <laughs> we can all be struck on ourselves a little bit, you know. Whenever I first started dating Kara, her grandmother was in the hospital, and she was on some medicine that I, it was like some truth serum, I guess, and she was, had no filter. I mean, we've been dating like a couple of weeks, and she said, we went, I went to the hospital to visit her and to pray for her, and she said, so good to see you. When I first met you, Brandon, I thought you were so struck on yourself. That's what she said. So I I've, I've laugh about that with her every time. You know, the truth is all of us, can have moments where we get struck on ourselves. And here's what I love. They didn't say, we're a big deal. We're the apostles. Leave us alone. They didn't put on, and they didn't also do the other thing. They didn't put on a cape and say, we will serve everything. We can do everything. 
We will solve every problem. See, sometimes we can get in that mentality with people where we think, you know what? I have to be the super person that that always rescues everybody from every problem and situation. They didn't do that. They got over themselves. They understood that God opposes the the proud, but gives, gives grace to the humble. They understood. You know what? We can't do it all. Yes, God's called us to be leaders, but here's the truth. We can't do this all by ourselves. It's not about us. We're getting over ourselves. Now I got a question today. Do you need to get over yourself a little bit? Yeah. <laughs> so so here's, here's some questions. These are introspective questions. You don't have to answer them out loud, but you can answer them in your notes or in your mind. Here's a question to know if you need to, how much you need to get over yourself. Do you take everything personally and get defensive? Like whenever there's an issue, do you always bow up and say, you know, or or maybe you're feeling defensive right now. You're like, who is he to ask me? (laughs) You always have to put up a case for yourself. You're easily offended. You wear your feelings on your sleeve. And once you're offended, it's just, it just continues to go and go and go and go. And you never own your part of the problem. You just are always defensive and you always take it personal. Just a question. (laughs) Number two, do you think your feelings are the most reasonable? Are you okay with other people feeling different than you? Are you always telling them how they should feel and how you're always right? Your feelings are real, but they're not always true. Three, are you the one always trying to fix everybody? Are you the person that always has to save the day? I'll take it a step further. Are you the one that allows, you you allow things to not be fixed or you purposely break things so that people will need you? So you try to swoop in and fix the problem every single time. You're finding your identity through what you do, not who you are in Christ. You've got to get over yourself. Number four, do you tend to be negative and critical instead of positive and grateful? Negativity in criticalness, that's the language of pride. Gratefulness and positivity and joy, that is the language of humility. Number five, last question. Do you keep thinking of other people that need to hear this message? (laughs) Gotcha. (laughs) It's not about not about them. I love what they said. They said, you know what? We gotta pray more and we gotta get in the word more. They didn't say the church is now 40,000 people. Let me tell you how awesome of leaders we are. Let me tell you how, okay, God, we got it from here. Sometimes we can do that in our own success. But I love the spirit of the apostles. They said, you know, as the church has grown, we actually need to spend more time with God as he moves in our lives in ministry. What is that? That's humility. That's saying, God, I need you more than anything else. We need more time in the word. I've, 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 this passage means so much to me because I feel like as a pastor, it's my model for how to live because I'm the guy that wants to fix everything. I'm the guy that wants to, to I, I, I've given my phone number away to thousands of people in the last nine years and happily did it. But what I've realized over, the, over time is that, you know, I can't do everything, but you know what I can do? I can seek the face of God because What City Hills needs is not more of Brandon Shanks. What City Hills needs is more of God's word and God's spirit. And it's my responsibility in this season that being entrusted by God to say, Lord, I got to get over myself and I got to seek your face. I have to make sure we're empowering others to be able to lead. This ministry is so important. But what's most important is that me and all of us are depending on God. One of the greatest indicators of how humble I am is how much I pray. Oh, that was hard. How much I pray equals how humble I am. There's a direct correlation. Why? Because if I don't pray about something, it's because I don't think I need help with something. Oh, goodness. Whenever I don't pray about something, I'm really saying without saying, God, I got this. I'll just... I'll just ask for your help whenever I mess this up or when it gets bigger than what I can handle. And the truth is, no, in humility, we say, God, I need you every day, every hour, every moment, every decision, every meeting, every thought. God, every every aspect of my life, I need you in my life. And because, And I will say this about our troubles and our trials. Don't despise any problem that causes you to pray more and to seek the face of God. It's a gift that God has allowed in your life to keep you dependent on him 
I love what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He says, I experienced like great revelations. He was talking about how God had done great things in his life. But watch what he says. In order to keep me from being conceited or prideful, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Are you in a season where you're praying, God, please take this messenger of Satan. Please take this thorn in the flesh. Please take this situation away from me. Verse 9 says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That's a man that is humbled before God. And I say to you, if you're in a season, don't make it all about you. Be humble yourself before the Lord and say, God, your grace is sufficient for me. Have your way in my life. I love what 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 says. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I will hear from heaven and forgive their sins and restore their land. There's so much promise on the other side of our humility before the Lord. Here's just something practical this week. Make prayer and time in the word a priority like never before this week. Let it be like oxygen for you. Maybe turn off distractions when you're driving down the road and say, Lord, speak to me. I humble myself. Ask God to help you with things. Maybe you feel like you can do in your own strength. That's pride because the truth is, unless God gives us another breath, we can't breathe one more moment today. And why don't we say, God, let it start today. Before you go to bed tonight, take some intentional time to pray and to seek the Lord and say, I've got to get over myself. Maybe for you that means to forgive or to let something go or don't just remain offended. Don't make it about yourself. Don't try to pray, God, change somebody else. God, change my life. Here's the second truth I see in this passage about the humble. Number two, the humble recognize their limits. They recognize they had limits. This is so powerful. Do you know you have limits? Do you know you're not God? Do you know you don't have to have every answer? You don't have to fix every problem. Serving the widows was such a good thing. But they realized they had limits and they knew that they would not have time and energy to teach the word if they were the ones distributing the food. So for the calling God had on their life for this season, they recognized what only they could do. Serving the widows was important, but teaching the word was important as well. And teaching the word was their unique responsibility in this season. And so they leaned into empowering others that could serve the widows. I know this is just simple walking through this passage. And this would be one of those passages it would be easy to go over because it doesn't seem as inspiring in the scripture. But every every word of God is inspired and is helpful for us in our lives. And here's the question for all of us. What are the things that only you can do? In this season, what are the things that only you can do? This is my example as a pastor. As our church grows, as I shared earlier, I have to say, God, what are the things that only I can do? I was thinking about the church. Only I can pray to receive vision from the Lord. It's the role God's entrusted to me in this season. Only I can protect, create the culture of our church family, make sure that we're on God's word and being focused. But it's, it's so much more than that. I love this church, but my first priority is to my family and to God. Only I can take care of my family. Only I can be a loving husband to my wife, Kara. Only I can be a father and example to my sons. Only I can take care of my health, my spiritual health, my emotional health, my physical health. So what does this look like for you? For me, it's learning to say no to good things so that I can say yes to great things. It's a hard word to learn how to say. It's actually one of the first words we learn, but as we get older, it's harder to say it. Can we say it together? No. Here we go. No. Oh, you sound great. One more time. No. Oh, that's, that's a good word to say. 
So I, I shared a few weeks ago that Friday is, a, is our sabbatical. It's a City Hills free zone as much as possible in our home so that we can rest and spend time together as a family. And on Fridays, I, um, Kara and I will try to go to breakfast together, spend some unique time together um, on that day. That's just our, our Sabbath day. And what started happening, I guess, about six months ago, maybe a little bit longer ago, but six months ago, I had some things that, um, you know, some meetings that I wasn't able to take care of throughout the week. So I said yes on some Fridays. Yeah, let's meet Friday morning. And so I, I did it early. I tried to, uh, tried to still be able to have time, but I, but I started compromising on that. And it got to a point where my wife said to me, this has to stop <laughs> because it will take over every day of our lives unless we say no. And I did not like saying no. I love saying yes and making people feel warm and fuzzy about their pastor and loving me. But what a tragedy if I invest my life in having breakfast, lunch, and dinner with every person in our church family, but don't have an intimate and healthy relationship with my own wife. What a tragedy if we spend our lives at work or school. I mean, you, you name it. I don't know what this, how, let the Holy Spirit apply it to your lives. But what are the things that only you can do? What I love about this example is they live from rest and margin instead of hurry and worry. The truth is any area of your life you cannot rest in, you cannot rule in. Any area you cannot rest in, you cannot rule in. If you always have to be work, 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 you'll never rule. Because there has to be a moment you turn it off and say, God, I rest in this. You're the one in charge of my work. Family, 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 family. You know, from, from one thing with your kids to the next, just, 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 just one thing, one thing, one thing. There has to be a moment where you say, you know what, we're going to turn this off. We're going to have a night of family blessing in our home tonight. We're going to rest in God. We're not going to just go, 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 go. We're going to center our family around God's word. Well, what if the kids don't get into the perfect school? What if they don't make the team? What if, they, what, what if that margin allows the Holy Spirit to move in our kids' lives and then God does more than what we could ever do in our own strength and power? You know, what, what, if you can't rest in it, you say, well, I'm going through a trial right now. <laughs> Psalm 23, bless me this week. The scripture says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. In other words, you can rest even in a trial. You can rest even when things are happening that you don't understand. Because if you can rest in it, God says you can rule in it in Jesus' name. Here's the third thing that I see in this passage. is the humble lift others. It says in verse 5, the proposal pleased the whole group. So they called Stephen. I cannot wait to preach about Stephen coming up. A man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. And Philip and Procurus and Nicander and Timon and... Parmenas and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert of Judaism. There's some, word, there's some names for you if you're looking for future ch children's names here. <laughs> they presented these men to the apostles and prayed and they laid their hands on them. In their humility, they celebrated and recognized the gift that God had put on other people. I think sometimes, see, they could have had the attitude, you know what, if we recognize any other leaders around here, that means people aren't going to see us for the leaders that we are. That's pride. Humility says, you know what? I recognize I can't do everything. And look, God is moving all around me. And I can celebrate and lift other people. And, and I think sometimes we do this. We think, you know what? If I recognize what God's doing in somebody else's life, it means he can't do it in my life. That's why we pray for other churches every week. Why? Because we're not in competition with other churches. Here's the truth. God can bless every church in this city and keep on blessing us at the same time. He's that good. That I think sometimes we think it's like God has 100 bucks, and if he gives somebody else 90 bucks, that means we only have 10 left. It's like, well, they got the good stuff, God. No, but the truth is God is able to bless all of us, and if God's blessing your neighbor, you should be rejoicing. That just means God's in the neighborhood, and you may be next. <laughs> okay, that sounded exciting, but here's, here, here's, where, here's where it comes down. Can you brag on a coworker that's doing good? Maybe even outshining you? Can you... Brag on a competitor company of yours? Oh, no. What about a family member? Oh, it's even worse. That's experiencing great success. Can you celebrate them? What about a friend in, this, in your school or in a youth group that is successful? Can you celebrate them? 
See, the world defines success by how many people serve us. God defines success by how many people we serve. Jesus said this, you know, the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. Their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. The truth is you will never go down lifting others up. You will never go down lifting others up, praying for them, encouraging them, empowering them. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but it's simply thinking of yourself less. It's saying, God, it's not about me. God, use me. That's why we have next steps, step one today at 1135. What's that about? Serving. Saying, I'm going to lift others up. See, the enemy would say, but you got to get your own life figured out. You got you got problems in your life. Well, rest today. And say, God, I'm going to rest here and I'm going to serve. And you watch God move. That's why we have Serve Saturday coming up. Why? Because we're a church that serves. We lift others up. Each of us have a part of the ministry. Watch this. As the disciples study the word and encourage and preach God's word and make sure they're following God's vision and the culture of the church, everybody starts finding their place in the church and that's the power of this. If God's called you to City Hills, we need you here. We need you using your gifts. We need you sharing your dreams that the Holy Spirit's put in your heart. We wanna get behind it and help you because as you do that, watch the result of humble leadership. Verse seven says, so the word of God spread. And the number of the disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Pastor Corey, can you help me out with something? Can you give me that chair on the front row? Yeah, I'll just take it. Thank you. We can easily be people and leaders that want to lift ourselves up above others. This is kind of mentality we can have. Better than others. Y'all pray for this chair, everybody. There's lots of prayer. We've already had the sound go out. Now if we can just... <laughs> this, is what, this is what naturally we do. Let me tell you how good I am. Let me promote myself. Let me do this for me. Let me fight back at you. Let me stay offended. I'm better than you. This is not the kind of leadership and life that God blesses. I want to show you what God blesses. I have to have the cameras help me out with this. Sometimes we think, well, this is it. I'll just be, I'll just be here. I'll just be just sitting here. I want to show you what God blesses. Bow before him. I'll take it even further. This is the kind of leadership that God blesses in our lives. Say, okay, when's he going to get up? This is getting awkward. <laughs> Strange. Okay, Brandon, get up now. That's weird. You know, the truth is to the world, humble leadership looks weird. You better stand up for yourself. You better do it for yourself. You better promote yourself. You better tell them what you can do. You better pull somebody else down. You better negotiate and make it all about you. You better put yourself in the best light. No, but God says, if you'll humble yourself, if you'll humble yourself under my power, if you'll do things different than the world, God says, in the right time, if you'll clothe yourself like this, God says, in the right time, whenever it's just right, I will lift you up and I'll use you to be a blessing and I'll use you to be a difference maker and I'll use you to change the world. So I say to you, church, City Hills, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. So humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, these are more than just words. You are the example of this, Jesus. You love us. You care for us. You came to serve us. Let us be remarkably humble people, God. Let us be so countercultural. Let's get over ourselves. Let's recognize we have some limits. Let us lift other people up, God. 
like you lift us up. In Jesus' name. Nobody looking around. If you're here today and you would say, Brandon, I'm far from God. I would love to pray for you to hear today. Maybe this message is for you. Let today mark a fresh start for you. Join me in this prayer today. Say, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. Change me. Save me. Forgive me of my sin and the way I've been living. Today I choose to turn around. Today I choose to trust in you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Be the Lord of my life. From this moment forward, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in this place. Can we give a God a hand clap of praise and just appreciation and thanks today? Thanks so much for watching this message uh, today online. Just know we're praying for you. We would love to serve you, help you however we can. If you just prayed that fresh start prayer with us today, text the word CH Hope to the number 97,000. We would love to help you on your journey. Please let us know. Go to cityhills.com for more information about City Hills Church here in Knoxville, Tennessee. God bless you. Let's go love God, love people, and change our world. Have a great day.